This episode of Troxel is supported by Avail. Avail helps AECO firms better manage, organize, and navigate information faster. This episode of Troxel is supported by Confluence, a small conference event for AEC professionals and technology providers to discuss industry trends and ideas together. It's put on by the fine folks at Avail. Learn more about the upcoming invite-only event happening in the spring of 2024 in New York City during this episode. This episode of the Troxel Podcast is made possible with support from Arc IT. Are you tired of standard IT services that miss the mark? Choose Arc IT for specialized, proactive IT management, BIM support, and robust data security tailored for architects. Whether you're a team of 10 or a growing firm of 50 plus, Arc IT understands the architecture industry and will empower your unique creative vision to enable you to do your best work. Embrace a technology team that enhances, not hinders, your design process. Visit getarcit.com for your free IT assessment and start transforming your firm and your tech experience today. That's G E T A R C H I T.com. Welcome to the Troxel Podcast. I'm Evan Troxel. This is the podcast where I have conversations with guests from the architectural community and beyond to talk about the coevolution of architecture and technology. And before we dive into today's very special episode, I have a small but significant request. If you enjoy these episodes, could you please subscribe to Troxel on YouTube and the audio podcast on your preferred platform? This subscription is incredibly valuable in supporting my efforts. Producing this podcast demands significant resources and time, and I genuinely hope you find it enriching for yourself and valuable for the AEC industry. Let me share a little insider detail with you. As I mentioned in the last episode as well, subscriber numbers directly influence our ability to attract better sponsors and high-profile guests. A larger audience makes this podcast more appealing to them, which in turn enriches your listening experience. Interestingly, my analytics show that about 70% of YouTube viewers aren't subscribed yet. So if you haven't subscribed, I encourage you to do so. It's free and a great way to support Troxel. And remember, it's not just about YouTube. Subscribing on your favorite audio podcast app is equally important. Besides subscribing, there are two more ways that you can support the show. You can now make a one-time donation at trxl.co slash donate or consider becoming a member. To learn more about the perks of membership and to join, simply click on the subscribe button that you'll find at trxl.co. Your support is crucial for the sustainability of the show, and I deeply appreciate it. Let's keep it growing together, and thank you so much in advance for your help in making 2024 a great year of content. Okay, so this is the first episode of what I'm calling the Campfire Series. My goal with episodes like the one you're about to hear are to go back, way back, and hear the stories from those who came before in the AEC tech space. You'll find valuable lessons for founders and fun stories for users and fans. In this episode, I am joined by Brad Shell. Brad is the co-founder of Atlas Software, who originally created SketchUp. In this episode, we hear about his experiences that led to the creation of SketchUp, deep insights into building the Atlas company culture and how it ultimately contributed to the product's success, his leadership philosophy and style, what he looked for when hiring, how they got funding, what they did differently than the other CAD and 3D modeling packages available at the time, how they created a product that to this day, 24 years later, continues to resonate so deeply with the hearts and minds of its users, how it got its name, and so much more. So take a break from the hustle and bustle of bleeding edge AEC tech, grab your favorite beverage, find a comfortable seat around the campfire, relax and settle in, and enjoy listening to Brad Shell as he tells the SketchUp story. Brad, welcome to the podcast. It's definitely great to have you here. I'm really excited about our conversation today. Yeah, thank you, Evan. I'm 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 honored that you want to hear the story. That's fun. 
Yeah, so this is the inaugural episode of what I'm kind of calling Campfire Stories on the Troxel podcast. And I want to go back and interview people like yourself who were there, in quotes, more towards the beginning of AEC Tech. And so you are one of the co-founders of SketchUp and Atlas Software, right? And I think what I read was that Atlas and SketchUp kind of formed around 1999, 2000. But I would love it if if you could, before we get into the whole SketchUp story, I you told me that you're not really a computer guy. And I would love to know kind of how in the world this all happened because I'm sure that there's a really interesting story there. Well, it is true. Um, I'm not really a tech guy at all, but you know, for me, the thing that is that has sort of uh, motivated me to start companies is just that classic issue of there's a problem out there that I see. Mm-hmm. And it's like, oh, I wonder why somebody's not doing that. And that was really the motivation behind SketchUp. Um, to back up a little bit, I actually was a structural engineer, went to school in Boulder and studied engineering. And let's see, I think I graduated in 82, showing my age. And uh, the economy was really bad. So I, I ended up getting a job on a framing crew. And uh, when I actually did start working in the industry, if you will, my first one of my first jobs was working for um, a brilliant guy who uh, did a lot of precast work. All of his work was precast. And, uh, you know, a precast building is essentially like a giant three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. And, and you know, essentially you have to create very accurate, uh, you know, construction drawings, elevations, plans, that sort of thing, but also very accurate, what we call piece drawings uh, that, you know, describe the individual pieces that are, that are, cast in a plant and then hauled out to a job site and put together. And, you know, it's pretty intricate. I mean, everything has to work, not only the aesthetics, you know, with reveals and medallions and all that other stuff that you see on the outside, but also how those pieces connect and interact to frame of the building, which sometimes is also precast, right? So, like I said, I worked for this brilliant, crazy, fun guy, Gary, and uh, he was an early adopter of 3D. Um, and sort of inspired me in terms of what you could do with 3D. Uh, And that became the motivation to to try and automate some of the processes that are involved in detailing a precast building. And really, really in many ways, what we did is, well, well, back up. So two good friends of mine, Claire Campbell and Dave Plunk, but they were graphics programmers. And I pitched this idea to them about starting this company and they thought I was nuts. And, and of course they told me later, they, they posed a challenge to me, which was if you can go out and raise money in the industry, it'll prove that the industry wants it and we'll have the money. So we'll do it. And they thought it would never happen. And I ended up talking to a really large precast company in Canada. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, sort of chief engineer there and and he he was when I gave him a demo about how this would work, he was in. He was like, Yep, we'll we'll throw some money at it, see what you guys can do. And so we we built this system that um essentially what you did, I mean it was okay, for those of you that are, you know, super techies, you're gonna roll your eyes, but essentially we were doing some really early BM. <laughs> And what we did is the basic concept was you model the building in 3D and you model all the parts in 3D. You, you could kind of mimic what was happening in the real world. You, make, you sort of make all the parts, mm-hmm. put them together, visually check mm-hmm. it, which was a crazy concept. And then we wrote software that um, enabled you to make kind of wide scale changes to that model. In you know, other words, you didn't have to go in and edit every single piece. And then what we did, which is really amazing, is we, we, we made a system whereby you could set up a, a title block and put all the, you know, describe the different views you wanted, the materials you wanted listed and so forth. And it would generate all the piece drawings automatically. And it was, mm-hmm. it was so much like science fiction at the time. I mean, it was crazy. Um, and what happened was, where, where this gets more relevant to this story, 
is I could go in and sell a company on this thing. You go into management and show them this thing and they would just be completely blown away because they know they know what the problems are. They know what the opportunity for error is. I mean, really the only thing that makes this work um, prior to CAD and 3D, specifically 3D, is just, you know, essentially all this is being sort of, if you will, figured out in somebody's head, a really talented draftsman or detailer is, is the person that's making all these connections. So if something changes, for instance, again, back, let's call it in the uh, construction documents, that has to propagate through all the piece drawings and so forth. It's a really actually challenging problem. So this system automated all of that. So if you made a change in the model, all the drawings were updated, all the material lists were updated, and it was 100% accurate, right? So we built a system around that, and and like I said, we could sell it to management. I mean, they just just completely blown away by it, right? Because they understood the the time savings and the accuracy that was sort of just inherent in the system. And we sold a seat for twenty thousand dollars, and. And the problem was, the challenge was, it got to the point where for ethical reasons, I sometimes wouldn't even sell them the software because what it really demanded is a, is a very competent 3D user. And they had a tendency to take a draftsman that had been on the boards for 30 years and say, well, he's our best draftsman, but that wasn't necessarily the best yeah. user. So if you had a competent mm -hmm. 3D user, then, then they could make this thing dance. It was really quite phenomenal. But the bottom line is we were easily 20, 30 years ahead of, 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 the, of the curve, of the market. It was just, it was too ahead of, ahead of its time. And, but what was fun about it is we made some neat technology and we were, we were doing this on the AutoCAD platform. AutoCAD had come out, uh, guys don't hold me to this. I think it was AutoCAD 10 or something and they had an API for it. And, and we wrote all this on top of AutoCAD. And so we were a registered developer and we made some pretty neat technology, some neat stuff. And the crew at Autodesk thought we were pretty innovative and they, they bought us, which for the three of us was like, you know, we felt like we had just won the lottery because, you know, here are these three yahoos out in Boulder doing our thing. And, you know, and the mother, <laughs> the mothership wanted us. Right. And, uh, of course right. we were also poor that. We didn't get a lot of money for it, but we felt like we were the richest people on the planet after the transaction. But uh, the big, huge takeaway from that, and the reason I'm telling the story is, you know, I, I was uh, being a structural engineer. I had a lot of math and physics and all that stuff. And so I understood, I understood a lot of the language of, if you will, of like these early CAD systems, you know, right hand rules and offsets and all the things that we used to have to do. You know, you draw a line, you didn't just sweep a line out, you went, you know, from zero, 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 com, you know, zero comma, zero comma, zero to 10 comma, you know what I mean? And, and, yep. and, yep. and I started thinking, you know what, um, maybe the problem, and, and I always thought this software was fairly easy. I mean, I understood the concepts, but it really, really hit, hit on me that, you know what, maybe the software is the problem here because what, mm -hmm. what broke my heart is in a typical, uh, design firm, for instance, you, know, you might have a hundred people in that design firm. And I think the rule of thumb was maybe 2% of that firm, literally a couple people in the back room were competent at 3D, you know, whether that was Max or something else, right? And it just, to me, it just seemed criminal because 3D is the ultimate way to express your ideas, to share those ideas, to work out, even as a designer, to work out all those things that make a design beautiful and so I started thinking about this and you know the thing I always found fascinating Evan, is how you architects can have a 3d vision in your head and you can you can put it on 2d paper and that is insanely complex and I used to think how yeah. in the world can these guys not do 3d I mean they're you know they do it in their heads all the time and this skill on paper and i started thinking well what if we presented it different first off what if we got rid of all these sort of mathematical notions and so forth and what if we allowed the designer or the person running it to work in any order they wanted to sort of in my mind sort of start on a 2d platform just drawing stuff and then maybe we start making it so they can pull things up and they can start manipulating it. And 
And it was a very, very simple idea. And so I, you know, I'm just sort of uh, enough of a ding a -ling that, you know, I'd be walking around and I'd look at something, I'd go, huh, well, how would I model that with this? You know, and, and I just spent a lot of time and I, ha I just kept notes. And I never told anybody about it. I just, it was kind of my own little thing. And I was just, it was sort of a problem to me that I thought was curious. Like, how could we, how could we potentially improve this, make it more accessible? Mm -hmm. So as a part of our um, interactions in our, the little company I was telling you about, we had, it was called Kadzooks. And we, uh, we got to know this guy named Joe Esch who worked for Spatial Technology. Spatial Technology made a modeling engine that was used in a lot of big applications. And Joe is, Joe was just a brilliant, brilliant graphics programmer. He's just amazing. So Joe approached me, this would have been, you know, years later or whatever. And, and he really, he'd always worked for companies and he really wanted to start a company. And he asked me if he wanted to be involved in a startup and, and, uh, and I turned him on to some deals that I knew of and none of those, he came back to me like a month or two later. I was like, you know, I checked those out. None of, they didn't really turn me on very much. And he said, you've got to have an idea. I said, well, I, you know, I've been, yeah, I've been kind of fiddling around with this thing, but I never really told anybody about it or whatever. And he goes, well, let's get together and talk about it. So, uh, you know, I showed Joe my notes and I was actually kind of nervous. I don't know why. I mean, just because he was so good at what he did, right? And Joe's, I think mm. Joe is legally blind. So, you know, he has his notes right up in front. He's, he's really a, kind of a quiet guy. And I mean, he's super funny and great, but he's kind of quiet naturally and opposite of me. And he's flipping through my notes and occasionally he'd ask, so, okay, so I'm going to grab that, and pull that over. I'm like, yeah, you know, and finally he sets him down and he goes, so this is sort of my word, since he's not here to defend himself, I'm just going to use my words. He basically said, <laughs> you know, he basically said, uh, it's amazing. I've never seen anything like it. Let's do it. And I sort of teased later that he probably could have been anything. He would have said, let's do it. Right. But so at any rate, um, the fun thing, the fun part about that, you know, sometimes you got to wonder about, you know, the universe kind of getting behind things because uh, I yeah. actually was a little bit bummed. Be, or not bomb, but I just wasn't ready necessarily to start another company because I know how much work it, it can be. I mean, it's a riot mm. too, and it's fun, but you know, it's just a lot of work. And so I went home and because <laughs> Joe, Joe having never started a company, he was like, well, can you raise money by like next Wednesday? Because, um, he had been made an <laughs> offer by some other company. And I was like, oh, thank goodness. You know, we're never going to get money raised that soon. But we just wanted some seed <laughs> This money. is your out. <laughs> yeah, this is my out. I'm like, oh, thank goodness, right? Well, I go home and I call <laughs> uh, a guy that I had gotten to know. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful guy. He's a friend of mine now. His name's Raleigh Rawls. I called Rawls up and I basically gave him, I swear, it was like a two-minute pitch. It was like, hey, I've got this idea and I think it might actually, you know, it, it might have some legs. And he was like, well, what are you after? I was like, oh, you know, like, maybe 60,000 just to basically cover Joe. So we get down the road six months and he's like, yeah, I'm in. Um, and that was it. You're like, where do you want the money set? And then it got, it was really sweet because my old business partner, Claire and her partner, Brian, they, I, I was meeting with them um, and they also wanted it. So we ended up taking money from those, those three and, and I think we only, I forgot how much we took. It wasn't a lot. Maybe it's 60, 80, I forget. And we started. And uh, it was just one of those magical things. Joe and I had a, just a wonderful synergy. He was just brilliant programmer. And like, I would just give enough direction for the sort of the major concepts. And then he would fill it in in just beautiful ways. And we both talk about, at least for me, it was we thought it would take six months to do the prototype. And I think I'm saying this right. We did it in six weeks in the fall of 99. Wow. And it was, wow. it was, it was, uh, it was probably one of the most fun, enjoyable times of my professional career because this thing that I've been dreaming about forever was coming to life. And, and Joe is so brilliant. I mean, he wrote, we didn't license anything. He wrote, uh, the graphics engine for SketchUp. He did everything. 
And it just shows you how talented he is. Wow. And, you know, every day, sometimes two, three times a day, he's sending me a new build and I'm playing with it. And, oh, we just had a blast. And I remember, I remember, I think I was over at Joe's house because we're both working out of our houses. And I, we had, we finally had sort of a thread through the software where you could get a sense of, of how it would perform. And, and I remember telling Joe, I said, Joe, I have no idea whether we'll make any money at this, but this is, this is amazing. Cause you know, I'd been a long time AutoCAD user at this point in 3D user. Mm -hmm. And I told him, mm -hmm. I said, this is amazing. I, again, I said, I don't know where we're going to make any money at it, but this is a, this is incredible. And, uh, you know, and I could, I could, I could bore you with stories about how we raise money and so forth. But, um, well, actually there, it is kind of a fun story. I'll tell you this one story. So, all right. So Raleigh, Raleigh threw money in, right. And he sort of forgot about it. And he was in Boulder. He lived in Dallas at the time he was in Boulder. And, and I said, Hey, do you want to see a demo of this thing we're working on? And I, I gave him a demo and my demo was typically what I would do is I would build kind of a simple house, almost like a dog house in, in AutoCAD. I'd be like, okay, so now I'm, you know, I'm starting here at zero, comma, zero, comma, zero. I'm going to go over 10 feet, you know, um, and then I'm going to go right hand rule up and, you know, and so I, and I, and I build this thing and it would usually take, I don't know, maybe it would take. 20 minutes or something to build this simple dog house. And I said, okay, well, let's try it in this new thing. You know, and I'd sweep out a rectangle, pull it up, draw a ridge, pull it up. And I go, there it is. And you know, he was like, y y you're kidding. I mean, wait, so what is this auto, what is this AutoCAD thing? I said, well, it's probably one of the most popular CAD programs in the world right now. And he's like, wait a minute, do that again. You know, like do that again. He's like, oh, so he was, he was blown away. He was like, well, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> At any rate, so he said, why don't you come down to Dallas and, and we'll, uh, I'll put some, some guys together and let's just see what, you know, the environment's going to be like to raise money. So I went down and he had uh, a bunch of his guys he knew from the Dallas area. Come to find out these are pretty big hitters. I, I didn't know. Um, I mean, for instance, uh, Rawls, Rawls had a, a hedge fund and, and Mark Cuban was, I think, one of his partners in that. And uh, so anyway, what I- No big deal. No big deal. You know, <laughs> thank goodness I didn't know who these people were, right? <laughs> so I went down there in classic form. Like, um, I'm not a big one for, for canning a presentation or anything. In fact, that was sort of the whole spirit mm -hmm. of SketchUp is in retrospect is that's what makes it so fun, right? Anyway, so I go down there. I, I kind of gave the little demo that I gave to Rawls and, you know, I drew this house in, in AutoCAD and I drew it, this thing that I think we weren't calling it SketchUp at the time. I think we were calling it something dumb like eSketch or something. At any rate, so I do this and, uh, and this guy says, Hey, could I try it? I'm like, yeah, sure. Whatever. You know, I cleared the screen. You got to remember there was no one due. <laughs> I don't even remember if there was a race. I mean, it was crude, right? So, yeah. and this guy just watched like a 15 minute demo. I give him the mouse, you know, I turn around, I'm talking to these guys and I'm, this guy's just going to flail. I mean, he's just going to get, you know, he's going to get decimated. Right. So I'm, I'm looking at all these guys, they're asking me questions about things and they're like, why do you think it'll work? And, you know, it's kind of like, oh, I think, you know, it was just very honest, just conversation. It wasn't going to snow anybody. In. So I turn around like. I literally think it was like 15 or 20 minutes later. And this guy had built like this actually kind of like custom house. Like it was actually really impressive. And he had already was making this terrain model in the back. Right. And, and I was just completely <laughs> blown away. And before I could say anything, he goes, this is unbelievable. This is what I've dreamed of my entire career. Well, come to find out he was an architect for these guys. He'd done pretty elaborate homes and stuff. And he's like, I've dreamed of this my entire career. I, I have bought and wasted more money on these damn 3D applications. I have spent a fortune on training. He just went off right on the frustration that everybody was feeling. So yeah. I just, at that point, I'm just being quiet, right? And I turn around yeah. and one of the guys goes, what's your valuation? And I just made it up on the fly. 
<laughs> right. Like Rawls is looking at it like, don't screw this up. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah. we had say a big number. Yeah. We had, we had <laughs> I think from that one trip or visit, I mean, like literally, I think it was like 45 minutes later, um, from that one meeting, we had commitments for many times more money than I wanted. And I wasn't even trying wow. to raise money. So we got funded very quickly and uh and then it was off to the races. Yeah, it was it was really That's incredible. It was really fun. This episode is made possible with support from Avail. In a world where precision meets creativity, where every line drawn holds the power to innovate, people like you are shaping the future. But let's face it, in the realm of design, the unknown is your least favorite companion. You've been stranded on the island of inefficient software, lost in the fog of endless searching for the right content. It's time to embark on a new journey, a journey to clarity, efficiency, and design excellence. It's time to get off that island and away from the unknown. Introducing Avail, the beacon in your design odyssey. Say goodbye to the daunting 10 to 20 minutes wasted per search, the costly interruptions in your creative flow. With Avail, your team will zip through content discovery, focusing more on designing and less on searching. Imagine a world where you can stop constantly fighting the costly fires caused by pulling content from past projects, building from scratch, or relying on personal libraries. Avail isn't just a tool, it's a revolution for AECO firms. Organize, manage, and navigate your project information with a leader that's proven in reliability, relatability, and success. Join the ranks of the top AECO firms who've already chosen Avail. In just 30 days, you could deploy Avail and witness a dramatic reduction in costly design errors. Whether it's your first CMS or you're considering a switch, there's someone you should meet. Will Rouse, your guide to all things Avail. Schedule an appointment and explore Avail's capabilities, onboarding programs, and professional services. Don't let your designs be clouded by inefficiency. Clear skies are just a click away. Go to getavail.com slash stranded and book a meeting with Will to start your Avail journey today. Avail, where your best design is just a search away. My thanks to Avail for supporting this episode of the Troxel podcast. And now let's get back to the conversation. Yeah, thank you so much for for sharing that story. I think that that was a a valuable thing because like talk about having the right people in the room or the right... that. The, the sleeper he you didn't even know that he was an architect right and he no. was able to he sold it for you on your behalf by by showing the value that that your rudimentary product you could could fulfill at such a rudimentary stage i think that that was just you got super lucky right there and i, and I think the other thing that really comes to mind is just this idea of the value of relationships and the people because you know this is a very different landscape than it is now with VC funding and pitch decks and attention spans being really short and uh, I, I, there's a lot of aver- adversity in the funding landscape, especially right now uh, because of the economy and inflation and all of those things. But what really stands out in your stories is you know I called up Rawls I, I and and you just these people the 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 business mechanics were based on relationships. And that to me is a, a really important aspect of what you're talking about. Well, and the other thing that was really fun for me, Joe and I had a really neat synergy between us. And, and so essentially, I, you know, I told Joe early on that I wanted to do some different things with the company. And part of that was because I have, I mean, this is, this could be a whole, I could go off for hours about this, but, um, you know, like for instance, when, when we got acquired by Autodesk and th- this is really for all you that work at Autodesk, my apologies in advance, cause this, I'm not trying to slam Autodesk, but the, the nature of a big company is to be honest, it's really hard to have a lot of good ideas percolate up. And the, the reason being is you have mm-hmm. to go through layers of management. It's just the, na- it's just human nature. It, it can happen anywhere, mm-hmm. right? And I would watch um, in, insanely creative programmers. Personally, I think programmers are some of the most creative people I know. And yet they would be very mm-hmm. insulated from the design process oftentimes. You'd have somebody that would, you know, sort of 
design this thing. It's like a phone book, you know, throw it in the back room to the programmers and say, okay, make this so, right? Yeah. And yeah. and then and then in general, my personal opinion is I think um, I think it's really hard to manage people. And I think it's a better approach to in many ways get out of their way and trust them. And so we tried to do yeah. tried to do a lot of this within our team. And uh, and wow, did it work? We also tried to have a really we we did at the time it was so unusual because we tried to have a really open, honest relationship with our customers as well. And it, 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 uh, wow. I mean, the community that formed around us was really amazing. And I think in some ways it was just, I think in some ways, you know, we had a pretty neat product. Well, actually I thought it was a really neat product. I mean, compared to what was out there. And, uh, and then we had this really nice connection on this sort of, human connection with our users you know for instance we had a a newsletter where it wasn't so much about how you know how great this product is and you should buy it the whole point of the newsletter was just to try and stay in touch with people because we started getting a lot of downloads and the idea was we're going to call people and follow up and say hey can we help you or whatever and and you just couldn't keep up the downloads were just going crazy. But, well, when I say crazy, let's put it in perspective. You know, we might get a hundred or 200 downloads okay. in a day, right? We're not talking about, um, yeah. and so we ended well, up. Well, because you're, you're talking about a time period when software was still sold on physical media, oh. right? That we still got discs in the mail uh, or we would buy them off the shelf yeah. at uh, Egghead or it, Comp USA or, it, you know, whatever back I know. in those you're, days. You're absolutely right. And so even downloads, yeah. <laughs> well, it was funny because in the early days of SketchUp, people would say, well, they'd buy it and they'd say, well, don't I get a box? I mean, it yeah. got so people, bad. People... We actually had to make a box yeah. that would have their authorization code in it. <laughs> like, wait a minute, I don't get documentation? Right. Well, you can you can print this if you want. Well, like, what? You right. know, it was such a different, it just shows you how quickly it changed. We were yeah. one of the right. first that had you know, a free download, which was, again, you know, Joe was like, Brad, do whatever you want. And because for me, it was really important. I really wanted users that, that, that the software really resonated with. I'd rather have the company fail than have people buy software. Like that guy's story that I was telling you about how frustrated it was. I didn't want that. I wanted people that honestly, mm -hmm. it resonated mm -hmm. with them. It worked for them. And so that was the motivation behind the free download, the free fully working download. And then, you know, I think we started off and we had 20 hours of use. And it was funny because our sales early on, it actually made me really nervous. Um, our sales were really slow. I mean, like a huge month was to sell five copies. And usually because I'm out taking mm -hmm. some architect to lunch and, you know, like, oh my gosh, if I can't get these guys to buy a $500 product after all that handle holding, we might be in trouble. And interestingly enough, early on, there was a lot of like, like, what, where, are you with Autodesk? Who are you with? Like, who, who made this? You know, I think there was a <laughs> lot of, it's too good to be true, mm. right? Mm -hmm. But what we found out was... Um, but we found out it took a while to figure it out, but our 20 hours of use was, was just too long. Like people were doing multiple projects with their 20 hours of use. So I think we ratcheted that down to eight and sales started taking off and, <laughs> but, <laughs> right. but finding that balance. That's interesting. Yeah. Where, where did the name at last come from? Are, were you at last at that time? Yeah, you know, it's funny because we had a naming session and, you know, you just start blasting through a million things. And, and I, it was right. one of the ones that I thought of and I didn't like it, but everyone else did. Um, so I was like, okay. So we called it at last. And, and, Having the at symbol in the name, I mean, it's very internet, right? Like kind of like iPod when, when Steve Jobs announced the iMac and then the iPod and the it, iPhone and all of these things. It was very internet-y at the it, time. And you know what? Obviously, I think 
we were trying to play off that a little bit. Um, and the, the funny thing is, little side story, we, we did a full day naming thing once we, we kind of, so basically in, uh, Joe and I did the prototype in, in the fall of 99. And then we, we raised money pretty quickly. And then basically, I think it was almost all of 2000 that we were building a real product. And it's, it's amazing how much time that takes, you know, with documentation and all that other stuff. Um, and, uh, Oh, gosh, what was I? I lost my train of thought. What were we just talking about? And help me out. <laughs> <laughs> the internet-y oh, the naming yes. session. Yes, yes, yes. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. So we were yep. we were trying to figure out what are we going to call this thing. And we did this naming session. It was like an all-day thing with our small team. And the name that popped out of that was just something I, I thought was ridiculous or something. And anyway, any rate, my, my brother Coop was over that night at my house. And I was telling about how, you know, this exhausting naming session. He goes, well, I would just call it SketchUp. Like, sketch that up. <laughs> and I was like, that's, that's brilliant. <laughs> nice. So Coop, Coop that's gets hilarious. for that. Sometimes we get a lot of, you know, a lot of hell for that. At any rate, but uh, that's how yeah. the name, yeah, that's how the name <laughs> ended up happening. <laughs> That, that's interesting. I mean, the and to think about kind of maybe you can paint a picture of what that initial release was like. What wh what were people downloading at that time? What what kind of tools did they get? Because the paradigm shift for SketchUp was simplicity, right? I mean, people right. were used to AutoCAD. They were used to a bunch of buttons or a bunch of keyboard commands. Um, you know, if you're a power user, you're definitely a keyboard command wizard. You had memorized all of those PL for P line and E for erase. And you, you had all that stuff kind of memorized, but SketchUp wasn't like that at all. Right. So paint, paint the picture of what the UI or, or the feature set that people were actually downloading in that, in the early days. Yeah. So the really fun thing about it is that the core of it has not changed at all. And that's really satisfying for right. me personally incredible staying power it, yeah. it's amazing to have i mean I'm, i hope it don't sound like i'm blowing my horn but because it's not me obviously i mean we had a insanely talented team and the team that's carrying it today is very talented but uh it's crazy to have a software product still be relevant and and i think i'm saying this correctly i have a little insider information i think you know the sales is still growing you know um yep i've heard that as well yeah yeah so the um you know, the, the challenge often, for me, the challenge is uh, it's actually harder to have a smaller tool set than it is to have a larger tool set. And if you strip out the viewing, the buttons that are related to viewing, like, you know, zoom extents mm -hmm. and pan and all this other stuff, if you take those away, I mean, the core buttons are just, you know, it's like line and push pull and rectangle, you know, it's, it's really it's really simple. And, mm -hmm. and I knew intuitively, I used to tell the team, I said, you guys are going to be blown away what people do with this. Cause you know, and, and I was very adamant about this is not an architecture program. This is for people to express their ideas in 3d. I said, you're going to be blown away by what happens. Cause it was, I got swept up in that when I got into 3d and it was, it was so true. It was so fun to watch. I mean, I think I'm saying this correctly. I mean, we, we would get like, we started getting uh, stuff sent to us from all over the world. That was also another thing that was amazing how, how it went worldwide. Uh, people would hack our, our DLL, it's a, it's a language library and translate it. It was in multiple languages and we weren't even in those countries, right? And we, wow. started, we started getting images from all over the world. I mean, like Mercedes even sending us images of designers that had designed parts of cars and stuff and you're like what because they could do it you know they were okay making their own tin models or whatever right so right. that was that was incredibly fun to see how some of that evolved and, and what happened it's just basically giving them the power to express themselves in 3d is what i'm trying to say and did you set out to deliver the minimum viable product or was it your goal to 
really simplify the UI, the, the interaction that people had with their software. Because I think those could be two completely different pathways forward for a, a company like yours. Yes. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, the so the 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 core the core of it these concepts were the things that I was sketching in my notes and and it's just here I sometimes I've gone back and looked at those notes so I should probably give those notes to somebody at some point but it's just amazing at how everything there happened and and Joe and our early programmers John Ulmer Susan Willard you know these these people have such a beautiful uh, synergy about how you could give if the, if they wanted feedback or if they wanted input, you could you could just sort of sketch out the, the basics of it and how they would implement that or add to it was just it was just an absolutely beautiful thing to watch. And but the goal consistently was to keep it small, keep it tight, because my personal thing is I wanted some, and Joe's everybody's everybody's goal was we wanted somebody to, be able to open this thing up and literally in five minutes have success. And if you didn't, we were going to lose them. And mm -hmm. it's amazing how often that worked. Uh, and then a corollary to that, you know, we did some things on the business side that were crazy at the time. The price was crazy, $4.95. Um, yeah. But also like free support. And I'd get a ton of mm -hmm. pushback from the team and investors. You can't do mm -hmm. free support. And I said, yes, you can. Because if you have ever had a software product, you spent, you know, whatever, in, in the case of a lot of CAD programs, thousands of dollars, and you call them up for a question, they say, oh, for $100 an hour, we'll answer that question. You know, it just infuriates right. you, right? And I said, right. no, no, we're going to have free support. And that turned out wow. to be insanely helpful, um, just in terms of people that were, that did have some challenges. Oftentimes the challenge was it was too simple. It was too simple. They didn't know like one guy wanted his money back because he said it's great for sketching things up, but I I can't draw accurately. And I go, well, let's let's first I first thing I did is give him his money back, and then I said, well, okay, let's try this. Just draw a line. And he goes, yeah, I have no idea how big that is. I said, well, just type in thirteen feet eleven seven eighths inches, and bam, there you go. <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, it yeah. was it was it it was uh, it, it was really fun to see it kind of take on a life of it of its own. Yeah. Well, I have to I have to ask you just about the idea of push pull. So you've mentioned it a little bit, right? You you sketch a thing, you pull it up, and and push pull was a game changer for so many people, and that to me was the hook of what got somebody hooked on SketchUp immediately. And so like, where did that come from? Where did push pull come from? And, and how did you realize that that was kind of the magic thing? In, cause to me, I assume that's the magic thing in SketchUp that really got so many people hooked on it. Well, again, for me, you know, and coming back to that basic concept was, hey, so if we make it so that somebody can just draw kind of like they're drawing on paper, We'll give them a little guidance system. We're not going to have the we're not going to have this concept of x, y, and z axes. We're going to try and get all that away. There's there's not going to be any specific order that they have to draw in or whatever. But like, I'll get to the push pull in a moment. But but like that actually ended up being I think an important component of this of how it worked. But mm. also this notion it blew me away that this notion of you draw a close shape and it it fills in, so to speak. I mean, mathematically, you know, we're yeah. putting skin on that, so to speak, we're putting a surface on that. Mm -hmm. But even that concept had never been done. And we patented that, you know, that was, we patented push pull. I mean, I couldn't believe it. Here's this fairly mature industry. And, uh, you know, to, to digress for a moment, I showed um, some higher ups at Autodesk sketch up early on, and I, I literally got laughed out of the room. And, you know, they said, Modeling's, it's done. It's mature. It's, you know, you, you're not going to make it. Mm, you can't make yeah. it on a four hundred ninety five dollar product. And I was like, but uh -huh. wait a minute. If people can't use the modeling tool, how is that of any value? <laughs> right. right. But uh, at any rate, the um, 
So coming back to that concept was I wanted people to, people to be able to kind of conceptually start drawing in 2D. And then I thought, okay, well, then they can push, pull it up and push it down. And, and they could introduce a line and pull that out or pull a face out. or Because again, coming back to that conversation or that what I said earlier is I'd be looking at things and literally I'd be like, I'm looking at a dresser right now. Okay, how would I model that? Well, I could draw it there and I could pull it up and I could push it, you know, and and I started seeing a pattern where, geez, you could do a lot with that and not really understand things. And it was kind of a fun little, well, I don't know if it's fun, but the only time Joe and I ever had any kind of disagreement was Joe had a very, very strong solids modeling background. And very early on, it was one of the first conversations we ever had. He said, you know, he said, well, I'm going to make a solids modeling engine. And I said, Joe, you can't do it. You can't. Solids modeling, that whole language, that interaction of solids modeling is never going to work with, it's not going to work. It's just, it's going to get in the way. And, you know, we probably had a heated discussion for not very long. He says, okay, we'll do a surface model. Interesting. Yeah. I, so I came from a Form Z background, and I'll just, this is where I come clean with you, Brad. I didn't didn't start using SketchUp until 2003, and I was, I just pulled up the very first model that I ever made in SketchUp. I have some images here, and I looked at the date, and it was May of 2003. So I don't know what version that was at that time, but um, coming from Form Z, the axis kernel, you talked about spatial technologies, like they're, the the 3D kernel for modeling was a solids and so I when I was in architecture school that was the tool that we learned it was that and or AutoCAD and 3D and AutoCAD was abysmal it was so difficult and Form Z was the alternative that we had access to and I have to tell you like SketchUp being a a surface modeler was I didn't like that at all. And so like yeah. Joe, I think, right? It, I would have loved to have had a conversation with somebody about that because that to me is like you were able to convince him fairly easily. You had this heated discussion and it was over. But I think for a lot of people, because we get so used to the tools that we have and we think that we're onto something that maybe we need, but maybe we don't, but we don't have anybody to, to bounce that off of. Then, then we just continue down the path that we're already on. I, it was the same thing for Rhino. Like that right. was a surface modeler. I right. wasn't. I was not interested in that because it. And so I, I just feel that very strongly for myself. And and I look back and I think, I wonder what else I've missed out on because of these kind of closely held beliefs that that are fairly useless at that <laughs> at that early well those and, early days. And let's let's face it, Evan. The fact that you were a Form Z user, you were a pretty advanced user. Yeah, it was, the, an, it was a um, it was a pretty complicated tools tool set right, for sure. Right, exactly. Mm. And, you know, and what Bob did with Rhino is is you know it's a gr it's another great product, right? And it's mm -hmm. does just amazing things with organic shapes, and you know it's phenomenal. It's still as relevant today as it was way back then. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. Well, let me share. I'm going to share with you my model here real quick just so you can see what I made in 2003 and I have to, so I will put it on the screen here of this video okay. and I will send you a, a, an <clears throat> image, but it, it, it's still, it was fun for me to look it up. Um, it was a playhouse for my kids oh, and fun. I actually built it in my back, in my backyard. And, uh, it, it was, this was my construction documents. It was just a 3d model. Yeah. And so kind of going back to your early BIM days of, of you know when you were you were building in a, a modeling system with constraints and everything updated and like that's kind of what this was for me it was just like i'm just going to measure it right off the screen i put it on my laptop i'd take it into the backyard and i would build with it right there and i, I thought right. that, that was that was just a really liberating experience how and for me the big difference with sketchup was like it's one view like you had top view left view right view but it was you were you were immediately put into perspective mode which forces you to think spatially kind of immediately. You talked about that, the wonder that you experienced with architects being able to think in 3D and slice it and dice it and make it into 2D all in their head. Like I didn't have to do that anymore with this. I didn't have to have the quad view, top view, left view, right. I was just always in 3D 
And I think that's another really interesting decision that you made early on. Can you talk about that? Like, why did you just present, put them right into 3D? That was very different than th what we had experienced up to that well, point. Well, you know, probably I have to give that credit to Joe. Um, you know, the reason quite honestly is, as you well know, Evan, if you start off in a plan view, so to speak, we, we didn't want really people have to think that much, right? Because as you well know, somebody yeah. could be drawing away forever and not realize they're in 3D. They could be coming off the page, you know what I mean? And so we're just like, no, right. let's just start them off in 3D. So immediately, because we're a 3D app, you know, that's that's what you do. Yeah. Um, yeah. The one, the one thing that we did that was really, uh, well, I'll tell you, I'll share a story with you that was really fun for me is, so I have an architect that I've used quite a bit in Boulder, his name's Steve Montgomery. And Steve is one of these old school, you know, pen and paper, beautiful. Everything he did was hand drawn. He's amazing. Uh, just like all you guys, he's an amazing sketcher. Now he's actually watercoloring and doing all kinds of beautiful work. He's just insanely talented designer and architect. Well, Steve had done work for me, but um, he was doing work for my younger brother. And, um, and Steve, I, I, I went down to Steve's office. He, he lived kind of down the street from me. He had a neat little, neat little office behind his house. And I went down there and, and I said, you want to try this new thing that I'm working on? And he's like, yeah, sure. He goes, I just bought my first computer today. He just bought his first computer. Wow. So I go down there with my <laughs> Perfect stack. timing. Exactly. You're, I, I go down the, there with my CD. You're the guy who has perfect timing. Perfect timing. <laughs> I go down there with my CD or whatever. And, I, and I, I'm not exaggerating. True story. I spent probably 15 minutes showing him how to use the mouse. You know, this is how it works. You know, you click and he's like, oh, cool. And then I fired up this early version of SketchUp and, uh, and I gave him literally like a 15 minute lesson. You know, here's how you orbit and here's, you know, just follow these axes, just follow the colored axes and draw. And it had push pull, it didn't have undo, it had a race at that point. And I was like, okay, I didn't even think he was gonna use it, you know, have fun. So this was on a Friday, he worked all the time. He calls me on Sunday and he says, hey, you wanna come down and see what I did? And I'm like, yeah, I figured he drew a box or something. I go down there and he had modeled. Low expectations. Yeah, Brad. very low expectations. I go down there. My brother's house was this beautiful old stone house with arches and, you know, fairly complicated roof lines. It was really, you know, beautiful home. You know, he expanded it quite a bit because it was pretty small. But he had modeled this house it, and I was blown away. There was no arc tool. There's no circles. There was no. And I'm like, Steve, this is this is unbelievable. Like I knew how he did it, but I had to ask him, how'd you do the arcs? He goes, well, I just drew a bunch of rays out and I connected them. You know, like he just got it, right? Yeah. And, he, and yeah. he goes, well, you should have seen what I built before, but I didn't know about saving and I lost my entire Saturn. <laughs> he goes, "He goes, I basically oh did God. an all-nighter on Friday because I was so into it, right? <laughs> and I was like, you know, I was like, that's it. That's it. You know, if we don't screw it wow. up on the business side, this thing may actually work. Yeah. yeah, it's super fun. This episode is made possible with support from Confluence. Picture this, October 2019, Lexington, Kentucky, the birthplace of Confluence, a place where tech leaders, AEC product developers, and practitioners came together for three transformative days. It was more than a conference. It was a confluence of ideas, discussions, and unforgettable social experiences. Since then, over 200 attendees have experienced the magic of Confluence. I've had the privilege of being part of three of these remarkable gatherings, two in Kentucky and one in Orange County, each one a melting pot of learning, collaboration, and camaraderie around a topic shaping our industry. And now we're thrilled to announce the next regional Confluence event in April 2024 in the vibrant heart of New York City. This time, we dive deep into the realms of AI and machine learning, unraveling their mysteries and potentials in our industry. Are you interested in being part of this exciting journey to continue the conversation to shape the future? Visit the link in the show notes for more details. Confluence, where ideas flow, connections form, and the future of AEC technology is shaped one conversation at a time. 
My thanks to Confluence for supporting this episode of the Troxel Podcast. And now let's get back to the conversation. Just just that your software was that stable is is an amazing feat in and of itself. Because back in those days, I mean, no software was never stable. It was SOS, save often, stupid, right? And it was yeah. like, how much time are you willing to redo? That's how many Every time you save, you need to save a new version so that you can go back and get stuff that you maybe wanted later in an earlier model or if you had to roll back to another version. And these were all like muscle memory for us back in those days. What exactly. was the keyboard shortcut for save as? And then we would add another number to the end of that file, right? Exactly. And at the end of the project, we'd have 42 different versions, you know, as basically breadcrumbs of the entire project. So yeah. just it, to even have a piece of software that worked all night and then he forgot to save and he lost his stuff is incredible <laughs> story back then. Yeah, I know. Well, you know, and honestly, that's a reflection of Joe and the team because they wrote such good code. I mean, the funny part is, is I basically did everything but code. And so mm. we would, this is kind of interesting on in our philosophy too, because, uh, you know, we would come out with a release and I literally, I literally would bang on it for an hour. That was QA. I mean, it's hilarious now when you think about it. But I also had an amazing knack to find bugs. But I'd, you know, I'd bang up for an hour and say, hey, it's good. Let's release it. And we had such a great relationship with our users, just a really honest relationship. Like, hey, guys, you know, and you're like, you, you got to check this out, you know, and, I'd, and we'd release it. And then we get all these downloads. And, and, and what happened with, with our, this whole notion of releasing, um, we would release fast and we'd release often. And we'd apologize like hell if it was messing things up or whatever, right? And uh -huh. everybody always forgave us and loved it, right? And it, it was they really- on the bleeding edge with you. Exactly. Right? They, they, they were living vicarious. Well, it, you were all doing it together. Exactly. You were on, on a mission. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And it, this community formed around that and it was just beautiful, right? And I think that we didn't even realize how, how viral it was going. And so, so from a, from a, business and speed standpoint, it was just, and from a energy standpoint, it was just a riot because, you know, we would throw these things out there. Like I remember when John, John Ulmer cooked up the shadows, which at the time was just unheard of real time shadows. I can scrub the time and Absolutely. the shadows move. And right. that was unheard yeah. of. John did all that. And I remember when we released it, I was like, oh, you guys, I, first time I saw it, I was just blown away. And this is like a testament to if you just get out of people's way and say, do what you want. And John yeah. cooked this up and we threw it out there and you just couldn't believe the forum and the feedback. And the like, for John, it was like crack because, you know, he was getting this instantaneous <laughs> feedback, right? Like, like, you know, poor John, the guy was so into it. Like, I think I had to threatened to fire him one summer because he's just working all the time. I was worried about his health. You know? <laughs> he's a maniac. Yeah. But, well, well, and, and to, to like double down on what you're saying there in those, in during that time, like we modeled in wireframe, we didn't even model in a shaded view. And if, it, if we did turn on a shaded view every once in a while, oftentimes the back faces were in front of the front faces. It just wouldn't shade correctly. I mean, we had, rudimentary graphics cards on very you know early power macintoshes back in the day right and it was like like there was no real 3d libraries there was nothing in the system there was i, I don't even know if there was open gl back then if there was it was very early days but but to be I, in a shaded model with shadows and ha have make it feel like i'm building an analog model on my desk as an architect we did this in school all the time it really felt like that on the computer. And I, I that was, uh, too, I'm so glad you brought up the shadows because it really brought me back to like, what what was the alternative back then? And it was very different. It was just working in wireframe all the time. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, we had, we had so many fun, crazy stories. Um, you know, a lot of it, a lot of it was, it was just the, it was just the start of like, um, you know, to some degree, even email and I, mean, I don't want to say email was new. That would be ridiculous. But, but we were, as a nature of my desire, and then pretty soon the whole company's desire, just have this op 
open, honest relationship with our customers. We, you know, mm -hmm. we'd share what we screwed up. We'd share, you know, we wrote this newsletter. It was more about entertainment and what's going on in the office and stupid things we did, right, than it was about the software or whatever. But, but it was kind of a shift to what is more common now, that kind of relationship. And, and, and that really helped fuel the, the relationships and the growth we had. But the, the interesting thing about it is just a little, a little story that you might find interesting, Evan, is um, we knew that our authorization thing was easy to hack. And we knew that people were sharing their authorization codes and it drove my team crazy. But I, it never bothered me. I thought it was great because it meant people were using it, right? I didn't care. It was all about use for me because I knew, I knew the money would come. Intuitively, I knew the money would come. And of course, that was the model that was on the horizon. The, the horizon, you know, with Google and all these companies prove this. It's, it's about use. It's about users. It's about eyeballs. And, right. But we put a little thing, and I had a long conversation with the team about it, about the tech guys, and said, hey, we're not going to do anything weird with this, but we put a little phone home ski feature in SketchUp. So it basically say, hey, I'm being used. If, if the user was online, it'd say I'm being used, and I'm in Russia or I'm in Germany, or I'm in North Korea, or I'm wherever, right? So we did that. And what do you think the ratio of legal seats to, let's call it illegal seats was? <laughs> Take a wild guess. I'm just going to go with the, I'm going to go with the standard 80-20 rule. It's got to be 80% illegal, 20% legal. <laughs> it was a, it was for every legal seat, there was a thousand illegal. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Wow. And I loved it. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> because we were, you know, we were, we were growing like a weed. We were, our, our smallest year's growth was a hundred percent. And, and what, what would happen, I think because of our price point being 495, I mean, we had tons of stories of people saying, you know what, my God, I've been using your stuff illegally in my firm. You know, we have 10 people for three years and, <laughs> and just, I've, I've spent, they would just say it. <laughs> and they would, and, they'd say, and we knew it, right? We didn't care. I didn't care. And they'd say, like, yeah, I probably got 10 right. hours of help on your, you know, free support. And it's like, you know, then I go buy one seat of X, Y, or Z, and it's $3,000 and yada, yada. And, and uh, at any rate, so they're like, yeah, it's the best deal going. And Wow. Uh, yeah. I That's that incredible. Was, that was interesting. So I have a question about, company culture and maybe it maybe this has to do with where you were operating out of coming out of Denver or Boulder sorry not Denver but the the right. idea of company culture you've brought it up a few times in the newsletter you would talk about what's going on in the office you didn't micromanage people you trusted what they were doing and i think that again that this is you were having fun and and the product was fun too do those two things go together is that really kind of a, a a a value that you held at the company and that you were putting into the culture intentionally to create a product and it was a reflection of the business or or were they informing yeah, each other yeah you know i think that's a really wonderful question and i and i think it is true i mean like i said i you know and again i'm i'm not trying to slam the big companies, it's just the nature, it's oftentimes it's just the human nature, I think. And uh, honestly, sometimes it was like a bad Dilbert cartoon. I mean, the stuff you would see, you just couldn't believe. You know, people reviewing an idea for a software product, and they didn't know how to use the software. Yeah. Telling you it's not, you know, and you're like, what? And so, like I said, I made a real conscious decision to try and get out of people's way. Hire, hire, talented people and, and try to get out of the way. And sometimes it was an extreme. I mean, like I did a demo one day for a, uh, a company down, down the street from us, a uh, really successful design company and, uh, mm. and their lead, kind of their lead tech guru guy, designer, architect, but he also ran all their computers and stuff. And it was amazing, you know, with all these different softwares. And he came in late and I gave him a little demo and I said, you want to have lunch? He's like, yeah. And we're having lunch. And I said, you want to work for us? He goes, yeah. You know, I just got a, <laughs> I just got a sense from him, right? And then he, yeah. his name is Yasser. He's a wonderful man, amazing guy. And, and, and he said, but I'm, I'm going to help my mom open a flower shop. So I'm going to be, I can't start for another three months. I said, no problem. You know, and I, 
you never heard from the guy, never heard from the guy. And Sarah was like, didn't you hire some guy? I was like, yeah, I thought I did. Well, this guy shows up one day <laughs> and he shaved up all his hair. So I didn't even recognize him. And, you know, he comes in and he's like, well, Yasser can correct me if I'm wrong, but since he's not here, I'm going to tell the story that I want to tell. But uh, he's like, oh, cool. He's like, okay, well, um, what, you know, what, what do you want me to do? I was like, I don't know. Why don't you just kind of dive in and look around, look at the web page, whatever, see, you know, what, see what you think, you know, see what turns you on, what, you know, where do, you know, he's like, well, where do you want me to sit? And I was like, well, why don't you try and find a place, you know, and what computer should I get? Get whatever you want. Here's a credit card. I mean, it was, it was, well, what, like how much vacation do I get? Take as much as you want. You know, there, there was just, it was, and actually I'm not exaggerating. It was like, Hey, you know, if you're self-motivated and into what you're doing, you don't need any guidance, you know, and you're going to come, you're going to come and ask for help or God, I'm stuck on this. Or what do you guys think? Or so we had a, we had a really open dynamic culture. It was, it was a blast. I mean, it, it really was super, it was like having this fun, wonderful, sometimes dysfunctional family, but my personal opinion is if you can't be completely yourself in an environment, it's really hard to be creative. Sometimes the yeah. meetings would start about something. We're trying to design something new or come up with something. And the ideas would be so stupid and hilarious, but then somebody like, Hey, wait a minute, you know, what, you know, and then that would lead to something that could be really interesting or, um, maybe I'm a little biased, but I think it, I think it definitely played a, a big part at, in our success. And it must have because people would come in and say, like, eventually we ended up taking a little money, which is another story, which we didn't need the money, but um, venture capitalists would come in and they're like, I've never been in, I've never been in an office like this. Like, you know, Phil saying that, you know, hairs on my arms stood up when I'd come into your office. There's just so much energy. You guys were just having <laughs> so much fun. And, um, <laughs> And that wasn't always the case. I don't, want to, I don't want to paint a picture like it was always like that. But I think if you can get, I think if you can get an environment where people truly can be themselves, and and I mean the good, the bad, everything, it really makes for um, you can you can really do amazing things. And in fact, it was kind of fun. Once one day, you know, we get acquired by Google, and, and one day I get a call from the head of HR for Google. It was a woman. I forget her name. My apologies. And she called and she said, she basically, she started off by saying something like, yeah, we're trying to figure out, we're trying to figure out like how we would find more people like your team or you. And she said, Brad, you'd never get a job here ever. And I was laughing. I was like, of course I wouldn't. I mean, I'd never get through the interview, right? Let alone my resume, you know, was terrible and everything else. And she said, yet, you know, so many of your people on paper are not that great, but they're just amazing, you know, in terms of their, their creativity and their skills. And I told her, I have no idea. I don't, I don't know how you put a formula on that. It was kind of neat in our company because I got, I used to do, I guess you could say I used to do a lot of the hiring, but I just got so busy with other stuff. And it was really sweet because the team picked up on this and they got worried. They got worried that the culture was somehow going to get changed because I wasn't doing the hiring, right? Mm -hmm. So they started this culture committee. And I think it was like sort of two groups. The first one, if it was technical, they kind of had to get through a little bit of a technical thing. And then the other one was more on the culture. And so this group would really try to get to know whoever it was. And if, if they didn't think they were going to fit in well, they weren't even going to get to me. And then And then I got to decide from like, two or three candidates or something like that. So it was neat to see that the team, it became really important to the team to try and preserve a little bit of that magic. You, you obviously had an amazing intuition, right? That to me is what, what is driving a lot of this. It, it drove the product, it drove the team, the culture, um, that, where does that come from? Where did this intuition, because as a structural engineer, did you have this intuition when it came to structure? Also, like, is this just something you see in all aspects of your life or was this something no. that you developed or just, <laughs> it's just innate, innate in you as a person? Well, I think maybe you're giving me too much praise, but, um, to the best of my 
knowledge. None of my buildings fell down, but um, <laughs> um, no, I think I don't know. I, 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 I seriously, I don't. I don't want to blow my horn um, much at all. It's just like I don't know. I guess I would just get a feeling like, hey, there's something about this person. I think I think they would do great. I think you know they would they would do well. And, uh, yeah. and there was a, you know, there was a couple of times that it, that it didn't work. I think, that, you know, one of the few people that I'd laid off was this guy that we hired and I, I, Jeff is his name. I won't pick on Jeff, but I could, like, he just wasn't producing. I just couldn't figure it out. And he was working remote. He just wasn't producing. He was doing a bunch of database stuff or something for us. And finally, one day I was like, Jeff, what in the world's going on? I and mean, this doesn't adding up. And he's like, oh, he kind of confessed that he was starting a company and spending a lot of time working on this other thing. And I was like, oh, well, thank goodness. That makes sense now. But, you know, you're toast. <laughs> you <know? laughs> I mean, I said it in a sweet way, but. Um, right. But no, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's sort of uh, in the category of duh, but when you have people that are enjoying what they're doing and excited about what they're doing and enjoying their environment, you know, they... they they want to do good things. They yeah. want to be there. And yeah, and that that was somehow we managed to capture that for the most part. Yeah. I, I just have a couple more questions for you. I know that I know that you you have other things that you have to get onto. Um one is how you obviously shape this product, you shape this team, but how did it shape you through this journey? What were there aspects of you that changed as you developed this product and this team? I think the thing that was really, really satisfying for me is to see how how people flourished. It was such a great confirmation mm -hmm. to see how people would flourish if you could get out of their way. It, it was really incredibly satisfying. Um, you're asking about myself, though. Um, you know, it. I just felt so grateful to to be on the ride. It it was just such a amazing experience. I mean, the company was growing very very quickly, and you know we're opening. We're we have quite a presence already in in Europe, and we're setting up distributors. Really, people are coming out of the woodwork that want to be distributors and so forth in Europe. And we had an office in Munich and we had a presence in London. And um, I mean, it was they were, you're just getting hit with so many new things and new experiences, you know, and then you're interacting with, you know, eventually with higher ups at Google. It's just like, it was just, you, you know, you're, you're in some of the best design firms in the world. Uh, and sometimes you, you, know, you go in and do demos and things and you feel like a rock star. I mean, people are clapping and, you know, it was just, <laughs> it, it was yeah. just a really, you, there was just so many fun, beautiful experiences from that and hard ones too. There was hard ones as well. But I think for me, Devin, that's a really good question, but for me, I, I think the takeaway was just how fun it was to have an idea of how you could run a company or uh, how you could run a company, not just from the standpoint of internally, but even externally and to have it work and to have it excel. It was like, it kind of was like, wow, it gives, it gives you a lot of, a lot of faith in humanity and people and mm. Yeah, it was just that was fun. That was that was really it, fun. In the category of SketchUp in your life, if we just limit it to that, because I know there's you're a, you're a multi-dimensional person. You do a lot of different stuff. You're you're I'm I'm amazed at all the th projects that you're continuing to work on. And but but is that what may is this really the most rewarding part of the of that journey for you? Is this what you are most proud of? Is what you just talked about? Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty high up there. You know, it's a pretty, 
it's a pretty wonderful thing to have an idea that, that a lot of people like, but also to, like I said, experience that, uh, that momentum or that wave you get on, you know, when you put the right people together. I mean, we were just a bunch of misfits in many ways, right? And to, to come in and have that kind of impact, um, and to have that experience like we did and the support of people from all around the world, it, it was really, it was really a pretty special experience. And honestly, if, you know, I, I had had some successes, you know, our, our little company Kadzooks was, was successful. I mean, we felt, like I said, we felt like we were rock stars and we sold that thing, you know, uh, although it wasn't a lot of money. Um, that was actually really satisfying as well. The, you know, the SketchUp thing was super satisfying. Um, and honestly, I, I probably would continue to do that, but um, it's also a lot of work. You know, it's a lot of work. And I kind of decided after, after SketchUp, I kind of decided that I wanted to try and sort of consciously step away from that, if you will, that world yeah. it sounds a little extreme mm -hmm. but just to see what else might might life might present and yeah to get that kind of buzz though when you have that community of people it's pretty hard to replicate to be honest i bet yeah yeah <laughs> this is one of those yeah yeah that, that it was just the the perfect timing i mean and we've talked about that several times now in in your story about about the kind of office culture that you had. You said you were a bunch of misfits. Like the, It reminds me of the stories of the original Mac team at Apple and putting up the pirate flag and being locked in a separate building. And they, they really were kind of like the rebel unit. Even, even ILM had the rebel unit for a long time where they were right. like a skunk works, you know, in a, in a larger landscape of way more corporate, way more polished, way more you know every marketing message that goes out is is highly is very wordsmithed it just gives me the sense that you were just way more real about everything and i and that's but, what i i think of as you're telling these stories yeah we were we were and it was fun to have it was fun to have i guess the world that's a little extreme but you know to have literally was worldwide to have the the kind of to embrace that, to love it, mm -hmm. actually, you know, like mm -hmm. in our newsletter, mm -hmm. you know, we would just, I, I, I usually wrote the newsletter and then we'd have a little get together because we usually had some dumb tagline. We all had to figure out what that was. We'd laugh our butts <laughs> off figuring that out, and then, <laughs> you know, but I mean, I, it was just whatever. It was like you were writing to your best friend. You're, you're, you're not going to, in, in fact, it, it was filled with spelling mistakes and stuff. And I, every time I did it, like I, I almost flunked out of English. I was so bad in English. Every time I did, I didn't spell check nothing. It just went. And every time there was a group of like six X, you know, probably elementary school teachers, it would send me the whole thing marked up with all the mistakes and, <laughs> and they'd be like, but I love Thank the you. newsletter, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, we would write about, th this is where you, you just knew how human at the core, we're all human. Right. And, oh my gosh, we would have so much fun. I mean, like I'd write about Tommy was walking to work and he stepped in dog do and he put his shoes in the alley and somebody stole, you know, it just, it, anything was fair game. And the, 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 the more <laughs> real and whatever it was, the more people loved it. So, you know, I'd write about people on the team or like one time it was April fools. And, uh, I did a thing like a fake prep, like a press release, you know, Boulder, Colorado, blah, blah, blah. Atlas Software announces the acquisition of Autodesk, right? And I, I wrote this whole thing and everyone's like, you cannot send that. You, you, you cannot send that. You're like, I already you are, did. You, we are going to get so sued. You know? And then I, then I sort of, I went on with like, it was a, you know, like it was a uh, true thing. And then I said, ah, April fools, my apologies, you know, to the shareholders and, and, uh, <laughs> employees of Autodesk and, and Carl, I think Carl Bass was the CEO at the time and I knew Carl and, and I hit the send button and then I had a huge panic attack because <laughs> I thought, okay, we're definitely going to get sued on this. <laughs> and it was, we got, cause it was something like, okay, you guys, if we, I forget the number, it was hilarious. I said something like, 
if we sell, you know, 38 million copies here in the next, you know, two days, we'll go out and buy out of them. There you go. <laughs> and you couldn't believe how the phone started ringing off the hook. All these people that were on the sidelines were like, you know, they got caught up in the whole stupidity of it. We sold hundreds of copies just because of that. At any rate, I think it was the next Monday, I'm looking through thousands of emails and there's one from Carl and Carl will probably laugh at this. And I'm like, oh God, here it is. You know, <laughs> Carl's going to sue us into the ground. And he wrote and he said, Brad, love the news. He said something like this, Brad, love the newsletter, but your price is way off. You got to add like another 50 million to the price. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Good luck, Carl. You know? <laughs> no. That's it's like, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's just having that ability to, you know, to be playful and fun and real. And we, you know, we'd share, we'd share tough stuff too. You know, we had, we had a, we had a couple employees that died and, you know, we'd share that. And, oh my God, the outpouring from around mm -hmm. the world. You just couldn't believe the outpouring. Thousands and thousands of emails of support and condolences. And, wow. Um, yeah. A real was, community. It was, it was, it was amazing. Yeah, it was really, it was real. I could tell stories all day long. It was really fun. Well, you're a great storyteller. I and and I I feel like uh, there's a lot of lessons in there, and and I think there's a lot of things that people who would listen to this show need to hear. And to me, the the AEC tech landscape that we follow very closely today, that the audience of this podcast and myself follow. Is a is just very different than that, right? And it, it kind of goes to those points I just brought up a minute ago about wordsmithing everything. And a lot of people have to be very careful. They feel like they have to be very careful about what they put out, and it has to be very curated. And there are other ways to do things. And I, I wonder what it would look like if it was more like what you're talking about, um, because SketchUp is one of those tools that people love, and I think we can all understand why that is now after listening to these stories with you. And so, I mean, just an amazing testament to the product that you built and the culture of the team that went into it, the brilliant people that you assembled to make that all happen. I, there's, there's so much rich, richness to that story. And so I really appreciate you taking the time to tell those stories today. And I'm glad about everything that you talked about. I mean, there's there were some amazing digressions in there that I think really underline the success or why it was so successful of what you were able to pull off. And, and it was just a really fun conversation. No, thanks, Evan. It's it, it, it fun that you wanted to hear the stories. Yeah, yeah. And it's um, it was a really wonderful ride with... Yeah. Great people. Great people. I tend to get more credit than I should. Our our team was amazing. Uh, they just did amazing things and our users were just so incredibly supportive and it was fun. Yeah. And in a minute yeah. I knew it was going to be like that. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I mean the 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 gamble the gamble paid off. Well, thank you so much, Brad. This has been an amazing conversation and uh and I hope to talk with you again sometime. Thanks, Evan. Take care.